Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh And very good day everyone Okay so, that, so today we're gonna um, Today is week 9 okay, And um, we're gonna do a, uh, a continuation of a final bit um, Of our few um, lectures Okay And um, uh, we'll just make start it now So what we'll do first is Because last week's lecture was a bit um, tense I would say um, so I don't have enough time to cover all the materials that I've prepared so today I'm gonna um, just continue a little bit and then afterwards we're gonna look into um, a new subtopic uh, which still falls under exam okay so still fall under uh, topic 2 enzymes um, but we will be looked at um, uh, enzyme activity or reactivity uh, reaction um, and inhibition so that's it reaction and inhibition okay so let's continue so what we've looked so far from last week is um, on specific is on the isolation and purification of enzyme and this is the summary of the whole thing that we looked at okay and uh, so it started off with the source okay, it can be cells or plant tissues and whatnot you homogenize it, you centrifuge it to, to get the crude extract. And then from this crude extract, normally what we do is we do a buffer precipitation where you can actually separate um, the component of interest which contains the um, enzyme or protein of interest and uh, another byproduct or byproduct which is a precipitate. Okay, and normally what you want is you want to keep the um, enzyme in the solution phase so that you can uh, push it forward uh, for a better purification and whatnot, but that is not always the case, of course. Okay, but uh, as I mentioned, it is preferable to have um, your extract in a solution in a refined form after you did your uh, precipitation process, so that you can carry on uh, from a refined product. You can um, do a chromatography on it, so that you can get a highly purified enzyme. And this is what you normally use. For any application okay all right so um, what we look at today is two slides of the affinity techniques that we have not yet covered okay and we looked at a new subtopic as I mentioned and um, um, because next week is week 10 okay so we're gonna have a quiz um, a second quiz that I've promised um, during the beginning of the semester so we have a second quiz um, and of course it will cover all the topics that you have learned so far. However, it will move way towards on the latest lectures. Okay, so um, whatever we covered on the first lecture will still be asked but it will be more focused on the second one. Okay? Alright. So, um, enzyme purification, what we've looked at also last week is um, the definition um, and, and the purpose. And the second one is we looked at the, the types of separation um, that is normally used. Okay, it's not, again, it's not really limited to only these, uh, but this is some of the processes that is normally used. Okay, we looked at uh, molecular size separation, uh, for example, the ultra centrifugation. Uh, per se and then we also looked at the affinity techniques which is um, um, histac uh, nickel and um, uh, for example a nickel column uh, whereby for a, uh, a modified enzyme having a histac can easily um, be purified using um, affinity or chromatography technique okay so what we looked at last week uh, I, I won't touch it again this week, okay? Alright, so enzyme purification. So, um, again, it's a molecular size separation, okay? We are looking at a very uh, molecularoscopic um, technique, okay? A very small, very minor, and looking at a very um, a detailed aspect of the separation. Um, so, affinity chromatography, uh, most commonly, as an example shown here, is histac protein and the non-chromatographic techniques uh, which we will discuss later okay and as, as I mentioned last week whereby you have a column 
Okay, you have a column. Imagine that this is just a normal column with you know cotton wool plug and whatnot. Um, what you can have is you can have beads of um nickel, um. Nickel beads, okay, underneath here. It's kind of like when you use a silica column, right? It's just that this time around you are using a a nickel. Uh, sorry. Yep. It's like when you are using a silica column, the whitey powdery stuff. But this time around, instead of using the silica, you are actually substituting substituting it with a nickel beads. Okay, so a nickel bead is just um a small bead with attached a nickel column. Nickel column, nickel metal. Okay, nickel metal. All right, so we have multiple of these. So when you have a histac, for example, um, in this protein, uh, it says here polyhistac. Um, but so normally when we say a polyhistac, um, the bare minimum that normally we do, or at least that's what I did, uh, last time was six histidines. Okay, um, so imagine this one is from one histidine. This one is either from two histidine. And you have another set, another four, okay, with with the uh, the same ending, and um, uh, histidine, uh, as you remember from your um, first year, um, chemistry, um, calling a uh, chelating agent, chelating agent, okay, whereby what do you need to have for for chelating metals, you need to have a lone pair, and of course. Being histidine containing nitrogen, you have lone pairs over there. So instead, but instead of having, uh, instead of just using one histidine, you use six histidine to maximize um the interaction between the column and and the protein of interest. Okay, so by doing this, you can actually um, what is shown on the left hand side, so um the target analyte or the protein of interest containing the histat will bind to um, the metal beads uh, more frequent and therefore it will elute the last okay simple that's the basic technique um, so specific uh, separation technique that enables high quality purification okay um, interaction of target enzyme with polymer bound uh, reversible inhibitor so why inhibitor we will look at it afterwards um, so some reason it's because uh, we will look at more specific inhibitors um, in the next few slides but um, some reason why using um, kind of like reversible inhibitor is because one it does not damage the protein the second one it bound but does not activate the catalytic process uh, three it's normally recyclable okay um, and four is a more specific to protein than peptides Imagine if you have a mix of um, uh, proteins and peptides in in a cell, okay? Because when you when you homogenize the cell, it doesn't mean that you only get your protein of interest. You will have a lot of other stuff. You get all these DNAs, uh, mRNAs. You have all these small organelles, um, amino acids, um, peptides, um, nucleic acids. So you have a lot of mixtures. So how do you actually purify them? So when you use, uh, for example, the histat, even though histidine uh, amino acid can bind to it, but when you have a six uh, polyhistidine chain, okay, like I mentioned, so the probability of um, all these six um, to bind to um, your affinity beads is higher, therefore you will get a better separation, okay, basic concept. Alright, another example of um, affinity technique um, under the subheadings or under the subcategory of non chromatographic technique. This chromatographic technique is normally you have a column, right? And then you purify it uh, as a separation process. But uh, this is a non chromatographic technique whereby um, you can either use a surface. Um, or filtration, for example, because filtration again, it's not um a chromatography technique. Or shown here is um a nanoparticle um approach or uh, magnetic properties that is used to actually um purify your stuff. Okay, so how do you do that? For example, um this is a commercial product. Okay, and they call it Mac vegan. Uh, Mac 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 is for magnetic. Um, I'm not sure why they call it vegan. 
Um, okay, so you, when you have a suspended McVegan um, protein A nanoparticle, this is an example, okay? And then you incubate your sample with the nanoparticle. So imagine the Y is your sample of interest. And of course, when you have it, when you're doing something like this, you need to know or you need to make sure that um, there are compatibility between um, your uh, nanoparticle and your sample, okay? Um, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it, uh, but we're not going to touch about it in very detail because what we are interested in is the process of purification. Okay, so when you have your um, the interaction between um, your protein of interest and your nanoparticle, what you can do next is you can just simply isolate or extract out um, your nanoparticle and therefore your protein of interest. So you put a magnet, a magnet for, um, for example, for a while. So you can actually see, um, you know, normally magnets attract metals, and metals is a bit, you know, um, sometimes it gets oxidized or the color of the metal is normally more dark compared to, um, say, the whole bulk solution of cells. So when you put a, a magnet, you can actually see kind of like um, black powdery moving to one direction to the magnets. And then uh, after a while, when you are satisfied with it, you can just simply um, tilt the um, container, remove all the um, solution, and we only have what what you only have is just your magnets, uh, your nanoparticle, and your product. Okay, and what you do next is just you know washing and whatnot to make sure that everything is clean, uh, while having your magnet in. Okay, and. Um, if you are interested in looking at this technology, you can always go to um, this website um, and um, they, they are bas basically the supplier of this McVegan um, nanoparticle separation technique. Okay, um, so that's it um, for the first section. So these are some references that you can use. Uh, we can move on to the um, second uh, subtopic which is um, enzymatic reaction and inhibition okay so we've looked at basically we've looked at enzymatic enzyme or enzyme reaction um, in a more uh, general manner when we are looking at the michaelis menten um, kinetics okay so um, for those who are actually forgotten what we did in in michaelis menten is we are focusing on um, the reactivity of um, of your substrate and a product forming an ES complex before it's actually um, producing your product. Okay, so these are the general um, idea about Michaelis Menten. So that's the equation, and then from here you can actually produce a product and a lot of calculations and a lot of um, equation that you can derive from this. <coughs> so, um, when we're talking about enzyme reaction, um, it occurs when an enzyme catalyses, catalyzes a reaction. Okay, very basic. Uh, basically, it's just a direct translation of the word enzyme reaction. Um, it's so these enzymes are actively participating in the reaction by either lowering the energy uh, activation energy, as most catalysts um catalyst okay so when you say the bender of catalyst so it, it, it does the same thing um, and lowering the activation energy by either formation of a temporary bond or some enzymes um, uses a cofactor and co um, enzymes to actually proceed forward and we've looked at um, one example which is acetyl CoA um, in uh, if I'm not mistaken last two or three lectures so you can always go back if you are actually forgotten about it or you can always um, go to the references list that uh, I've provided and look through the um, textbook. Okay, um, where do I go back? All right, so um, chemically, the application of um, enzymatic reaction is very straightforward. Um, this is an example um, of an aerylation, a de aerylation reaction whereby if you have um, uh, a phenolic um, compound like this, okay, phenolic is that particular section over there. So if you have a, a phenolic or um, so to say the whole structure is um, phenooxyphenol, okay, 
So uh, phenol, oxy, and then phenol, the structure. Um, in the presence of a P450 enzyme. So P450 is, um, it can be an oxidizer. Okay, there, there are a few functions uh, about P450. An example here is, it's an oxidizer. Um, but at the same time, it actually uh, de-arylate um, the aromatic ring. Okay, de aerylation means uh, removal of uh, part of the component of the aromatic. So what will happen if you have this? When you have this um, phenooxyphenol, uh, we put in a P450. What will happen is that uh, I'm not gonna look. I'm not gonna show the um, mechanism because um, when I look through the mechanism, it's actually a proposed mechanism, so it's not really um, a, a approved ones. Okay, but what is known is that when you have this, you put in um, P450, you definitely get this product. So no mechanism of action can be proposed, but um, based on the proposal, it's not really clear cut, so I'm not going to touch about it. Okay, so when you have this, what will happen is that, um, so you still have your benzene there, um, so you oxidize um, the alcohol to a, um, kind of a ketone group, oh sorry, that is a wrong one, I'll just change this to rubber, okay. So what you have is, um, it's still an aromatic. I mean, it's still a conjugated, um, a double bond a ring, there. But you have uh, one double bond, um, one carbonyl on the top side, and then you have another carbonyl at the bottom side. Okay, so this is part of the P four fifty reaction, and of course, you will have um that as um, the other products all right um, at the same time if you were to use um, p450 so again it's a category of enzyme it doesn't mean that these two enzymes are identical okay so they are they can be similar because of um, the identity of the enzyme are similar but they can have different processes so what you can have is you can actually form um, this uh, pyridoid indole aniline product from two reactants okay so um, just a refresher if you look at this um, the it's very easy if you have two products um, to forming um, this type of category and um, instead of cutting on the double bonds or, or the um, um, pi bond you can easily cut off over there okay in the middle so what you have is you have and aniline is one of the um, reactant and then you have this um, uh, pyrido indole structure so um, indole is that one um, pyridone is um, that particular structure so you have a, a benzene ring attached to a five member ring with an N okay so what you have then is um something like this uh, apologies for the ugly drawing okay so that is the original um, structure so you have your pyridoid indole plus aniline um, in the presence of p450 p450 enzyme and then you will produce this um, pyridoid indole aniline structure okay these are some of example of enzymatic reaction now However, so when we're talking about enzyme inhibition, okay, so the enzymic activity can also be influenced uh, by formation or, or presence of inhibitor. So sometimes a product can also be um, the inhibitor of that particular enzyme, especially in our body. We do have um, uh, enzyme by which um, the product that is produced under high concentration are actually inhibiting the enzyme. Um, activity so we do have that as an example but um, because that's biology I'm not going to touch about it I will try and find an example um, that is more suited to our category which is a biotechnology in chemistry okay so um, under that um, better <coughs> so what is an inhibitor so in in general terms inhibitor are compounds or is uh, a compounds or a compound that slows or stops an enzymatic reaction 
temporarily and permanently okay so there are four main um keywords that i put there okay and we will look at it um individually what do you mean by slows down what do you mean by stops why do you, what do i mean by a temporarily or a permanently um uh, temporarily or permanently stopping the reaction okay um, because this is like a very wide um, slowing down uh, meaning that um, okay so you know that enzyme is always active when you have your substrate so slowing down if you if i were to to draw a graph is um, that is a normal um, enzymatic graph activity okay so it's similar to our mechalis maintain um, graph that i've shown previously okay so you have like a very um, steep um, start and then it, it will start to play too because um, you know sometimes your um, substrate um, getting less um, and because of equilibrium and whatnot now when you have um, when you have this um, when, when you see that it's slowing down the reaction what actually happens is something like that okay so it slows down the reaction but not as to um, well it can also slow it like that okay as long as it's no longer fitting the um, a normal um, enzymatic uh, graph okay which is supposed to be like a more parabolic then we can consider that it's slowing down and what do i mean by stops um, of course when i say it stops meaning that um, the inhibitor um, straight away inhibits the uh, enzyme and the enzyme no longer function um, so and and each of these can either be temporary or permanent okay um, and what I mean by temporarily is that it stops the enzyme activity um, for a while or slows down so if you're talking about slow slowing down, then it can slow down temporarily, or it can slows down permanently, meaning that the enzyme activity is forever slow until the protein is being degraded and re uh, re reform again, or you can actually um stops it altogether. Okay, and um um to to give an example um of um slowing down. Um, or, or slowing down temporarily is a bit difficult it's more on um, you know if you say um, the, the, the drug uh, the inhibitor concentration is low then of course you can slow it down so even if the inhibitor stop can stop the reaction but if say there's 20 enzyme but then you only take um, say 5 uh, inhibitors which is illogical I know but this is just um um, a way for you to imagine okay so if say 20 forms um, a normal kinetic um, reaction for enzyme enzymatic uh, graph when you have five inhibitor of course it will slow down the reaction right so it, it will probably slow down something like that and this is a slowing down and it can be temporarily or uh, permanently depending on the nature of the inhibitor okay um, and a good example of um, it almost stops um, but temporarily is when we have a fever. What we eat, we always eat paracetamol. Okay, so paracetamol is actually an inhibitor um, that inhibits one of the um, um, proteins uh, or protein receptor. It's not really an enzyme, but you know, same category is fall under the banner of proteins that, that inhibits um, uh, a protein in our body. Uh, that makes us feel better okay but uh, it doesn't mean that you are no longer sick okay so you're actually sick but because of this inhibitor um, it stops the um, um, protein activity um, in a similar way that it stops an enzymatic activity and therefore you feel fresh or energized but after the inhibitor has been um, cleaned out from your body then if you are uh, still sick then you will have your fever again okay so that's an example all right um so um it slows down and stops it's all depending on um the nature of the inhibitor 
Okay, depending on the nature. So if the nature forms a covalent bond, for example, um, with the enzyme, then you can always um, guarantee that um, it actually will stop the reaction. Okay, but if it forms a, a um, non-covalent forces, uh, non-covalent bonds, um, then there is a very high chance that um, the inhibitor is uh, slowing down the reaction instead of stopping it altogether. Okay, and similarly, it all relates back to temporarily or permanent. So something that is permanent normally, again, I say normally, it doesn't always be like that. Um, normally forms a covalent bond between um, the inhibitor and the enzyme while temporary means that it uses a, a non-covalent approach um, to actually inhibit um, the enzyme. Now we will look at um, in more detail um, about enzyme inhibitor um, in the sense that what are the categories? Okay, So there are different types of inhibition that can happen as I mentioned even by using these four keywords, uh, I did mention about um, it can either form a covalent bond or, or non-covalent bond and so on and so forth and it can be temporary or permanent and, and whatnot. So when we look at um, types of inhibition, um, uh, the category, um, and each category are actually um, different in, in one way or another but towards the end of the day, it will fall back to either slows or stops temporarily or permanent okay so um, basically there there are three types of um, inhibition um, one we call it a competitive inhibition a uh, second one is a non-competitive inhibition and the third one is uncompetitive inhibition confused let's see let's let's go to the next um, slide and we will look at in more detail one, one by one what do I mean by this three keywords all right a competitive inhibition so um, again as I mentioned it can be reversible or non reversible and this one is a permanent and this one is temporary okay um, so depending on the nature it can be reversible it can be um, non reversible um, but the word competitive means that um, the target enzyme is a competitive um, is is um, is latching onto the same active side of the enzyme as the substrate so if you were to to write it like this okay we have a substrate and then you have an enzyme okay and then uh, forming I'll just you know for simplicity I'll just write the equilibrium um, arrow as equal okay um, because we are not looking at mechanism maintain equation per se now um, you form the ES complex and then from there then you should uh, form or regenerate the enzyme or the product okay um, but what does a competitive means is that because it's um, binding on the same um, active site so if you were to draw imagine that that one is your enzyme okay and if your product originally like this oh, oh sorry not product substrate uh, you can also have something that has a similar um, surface okay similar surface contact um, compared to your substrate so both of these can actually competitive competing uh, for the same active site so active site is the site whereby the reaction takes place okay so this is how competitive uh, inhibition works so you you have um, um, normal substrate for the enzyme you put in something um, that will compete um, on the same active site so paracetamol is an example of a competitive inhibitor um, that we normally see in our daily life okay um, <clears throat> and, and to generalize the reaction what will happen is that you can also have uh, another subset or another direction of the um, enzyme which is this okay so now instead of having an ES complex you can you will have an EI complex 
uh, which will also you know it will fall back and uh, depending on whether it's a permanent or a, a temporary or reversible or non reversible reaction so you can either have a permanent EI complex or you can have the EI complex moving back into the E plus I and the E can now have um, interact with uh, the E the, the enzyme can now interact with its own substrate the natural substrate forming the ES uh, complex and form, uh, forming the product so if you have something like this then of course that will not happen okay so that is a competitive inhibition <coughs> so um normally when you are doing a drug design and development um this is um part of the part three that we are looking at so normally we have an uh, enzyme target and then or uh, and and you will you know do a similar system looking at active sites uh, um, for example and um, producing a product that can bind strongly to the active site to inhibit the process <coughs> I will talk about my research a little bit when it touches um, the the correct terminology okay <coughs> The second one is um the second uh, types of inhibition is non competitive inhibition. Um, you know the name is is already defining what it does. It inhibits the enzyme, but not at the active site. Okay, so it's a secondary site or tertiary site or quaternary site. It doesn't matter as long as it's not on the active site. Uh, then we call it as um non competitive inhibitor. Okay, if I were to draw it, imagine. If it's like this, okay, so this is still your enzyme, you still have your substrate looking like that, but now you have mm, um, okay, lah. I mean, um, I will draw it smaller so that this side can actually go into that, okay. So this is your inhibitor, that's your enzyme. Oh, sorry, that's your substrate, and the bigger Pac Man is your enzyme, okay. So now when we are talking about non-competitive inhibitor, uh, of course, it's not affecting the active site, but um, it will still cause a blockade of access of the um, substrate to the active site as a result of structural change. So um, we know that uh, from the two models that we touch, lock and key and um, industry, we know that enzymes are more dynamic. Okay, so it's not a static um, a molecule. So it's more dynamic. So imagine that when you have um, an inhibitor in this uh, example binding at the secondary site, so what it might cause is that it might cause a certain restriction on the movement uh, or structural movement of the enzyme. Therefore, even if the substrate can enter, for example, if the situation where the substrate can actually still bind to the active site, because um, the, the movement of the enzyme is now restricted, so the catalytic process cannot take place. Okay, that's one option. A second option is that imagine if the substrate, like the Pac-Man that I've drawn, is like that. Okay, so and when when there is an inhibitor coming from the other uh, secondary site, what might happen is that it might cause the structural change so that the active site, for example, becomes smaller. So when it becomes smaller, so you cannot uh, the the normal substrate or the natural substrate can now no longer bind to the active site and therefore no catalytic reaction taking place and to draw this um, in a um, reaction scheme because we are chemists we like reaction scheme I hope you do uh, you, you do okay so you you have the normal ones es um, es complex and then just for simplicity, okay, you have the enzyme plus the product. Okay, when you're talking about non competitive, how it will look like? Um, again, you will have um, the inhibitor, oops, the inhibitor reacting at the same place as per what we've drawn last time. Okay, you have something like this, but now, um, there is an extra so um, of course from here you will form the um, EI complex 
Um, but what can also happen is that depending on whether the inhibitor slows down the reaction or stops the reaction, um, you can actually still have the EI complex um, reacting with the S, okay, with the substrate, um, either now forming the EIS complex or um, just the ES now plus the inhibitor if the inhibitor is a weak inhibitor whereby you know um, substrate has a better interaction so it pushes out the, the inhibitor that can also happen and, and thus you can move back to the normal ES complex and therefore you still get your product but at a slow rate as I mentioned okay so that's that's one way to do it um, and so that's the first representation that is the second representation so what you need to understand is that a non-competitive um, um, uh, ways of uh, producing the product is still there okay it doesn't mean that it stops altogether uh, as per the competitive inhibitor so a um, non-competitive inhibitor still can produce a product all right um, now moving on the, to the third um, category which is the uncompetitive inhibition is that um, the inhibitor still um, can either slows down the reaction or stops the reaction however it forms um, the it, it, it binds to the um, enzyme substrate complex instead of a free enzyme so meaning that um, if you have uh, again enzyme here probably we'll, we'll just make a hole back there as per uh, previous slide okay you have your substrate you have your inhibitor so the inhibitor is big enough that um, a free uh, unbound enzyme in a free and en en unbound enzyme it cannot bind to the enzyme at all um, so the substrate can still bind to the enzyme however when the substrate binds or oh, substrate should, should look like that okay however when the substrate binds to the enzyme because of the dynamic movement now so it opens up um, the secondary side okay and when this happens your inhibitor can now go in and inhibit um, either temporarily or permanently the enzyme substrate complex okay and therefore because of the inhibition because again you, you need the flexibility right so you need to have a flexible movement to uh, get the best interaction and then once the reaction have occurred you also need to have another interaction to release the uh, the product so by inhibiting um, the release mechanism then you no longer uh, forming the product at the normal rate that you normally have all right so to, to again um, draw um, a reaction mechanism so first off you draw the um, normal ones yes complex um, ENP okay and now because uh, as I mentioned a non-competitive inhibitor inhibits um, at the ES complex now you you have another branch okay E S I okay um, so um, of course uh, ESI will not proceed directly forming a product because as I mentioned if um, the product formation comes from the flexibility of the um, the structure uh, oops you need to have I here okay so you need to make sure that the I the inhibitor is unbound first then you can form a product okay so that's why this step is very critical and basically that's it that's um, the general bit I'm not gonna touch about an example and whatnot it will just be theoretical I think theoretical is enough for you guys um, if you are interested then of course you can talk to me uh, I will probably can give you a, a, a good example but um, the general idea about enzyme inhibition is um, I mentioned 
So again, uh, inhibitor is a compound that stops or slows an enzymatic reaction temporarily or permanently. Okay, based on the theory that I mentioned. However, until today, there is still lacking in proving that non-competitive and uncompetitive inhibition um, reaction actually exists structurally. Okay. So we know that theoretically they are possible. Uh, we know that you can actually do a reaction and show that this thing actually um, occurs um, based on you know, a lot of um, analysis and whatnot. But um, to show that um, the inhibition and uh, the inhibitor actually binds to these spots, for example, um, it's not as much as an um, um, example that um, a substrate binds to an active site. So that is very easy and there's a lot of example whereby substrate binds to a specific site and then people manage to crystallize this and then do x-ray crystallography or NMR spectroscopy to actually look at the interaction and to look at where the substrate actually position itself um, in the whole enzymatic structure. But to say the non-competitive and uncompetitive ones, because as I mentioned, there is a secondary site so this secondary site is actually a bit difficult to predict um, and to uh, well to predict theoretically is, is okay but to prove that it's actually the site of inhibition is a bit um, uh, difficult so um, that is what uh, I did um, as part of my sub um, research project whereby I designed inhibitors um, against uh, a dengue um, protein so uh, that protein is just a protein it doesn't catalyze an enzyme but the protein is very important structurally to keep um, to, to make sure that um, dengue virus actually able to infect a cell okay uh, meaning that you know it, it it's kind of like virus infecting yourself so something foreign going into our body causing uh, a lot of uh, reaction so um, so that's what I did. So I did a prediction, computational prediction um, to design my molecule of interest, uh, synthesize them and then test it experimentally. So um, under in the experiment, I managed to show that you know the product that we designed uh, can actually slows down the rate of migration of dengue virus. So you know that your, your, your inhibitor does something but to co-crystallize um, the inhibitor and the viral particle or the, the envelope particle is a totally different um, topic and is very difficult to do actually do. So that's why I say here there is still lacking in proving that non-competitive and uncompetitive inhibition um, uh, exists structurally. We know that it does something but we don't um, sometimes you well, well there's a lot of enzymes um, so and there's a lot of inhibitor but you cannot show all of them are actually doing what you want okay that's that's what i mean <coughs> okay so um an example um, of uh, competitive inhibition uh, can be um extract out from this manuscript um so uh, an example here is that um, a lithium uh, metal even though it's a metal so it inhibits a protein that requires magnesium to actually uh, work properly so what it's shown here is uh, what these people uh, ex did was a uh, co-crystallize of the uh, enzyme and the metals and they managed to show that um, the uh, in the presence of uh, lithium so that is lithium that one is magnesium so normally that one is magnesium as well so in the presence of a lithium whereby the lithium uh, substituting one of the um, uh, magnesium metals so it ch changes the uh, electron density of the whole um, structure uh, of the whole um, protein structure or, or enzyme structure can you remember or we'll just call it protein it may be an enzyme um, but because this metal so most likely it's an enzyme so it changed the structure of the whole enzyme and therefore it's no longer active okay so this is an example of competitive why competitive because it's replacing um, the um, same um, not really substrate but ingredient at the active site okay um, an example if you still don't understand I'm just trying to push everything to, to finishing so that's why I, I, I won't describe it in, in more detail 
Um, second example is uh, a non-competitive one, um, whereby this group was able to show that cyclohexylamine um, inhibits this alkyl phosphatase uh, uh, in not really on the active site but near the active site. Okay, so um, what this figure on the left hand side is showing is um, the nitrophenyl phosphate which is the natural substance for this VAP uh, enzyme and that structure is actually this one uh, so that around there is the active site now when you have um, cyclohexylamine they will manage to co-crystallize so they managed to show that co -crystal, um, uh, cyclohexylamine actually slows down the reaction um, and what they did was um, and and of course, they know that it's not on the active site itself because uh, on the active site, normally, if that happens, when you increase the concentration of your inhibitor, at one point, you will like almost or 100% or stop the reaction. But what they, see, what they saw was that the reaction slows down. It doesn't stop. So that is a good suggestion that it's actually not on the exact active site. So it's not competing between one another. So they know that it's either um, uncompetitive or non-competitive. So um, when they co-crystallize the whole thing, what they managed to um, get from the co-crystals is that there are two spots by which um, the cyclohexylamine binds to the enzyme. Okay, so one is very near to the active site. So you might say that is um, competitive, which is fine. But the second spot, where the cyclohexyl A um, binds, cyclohexyl amine binds, are uh, quite far away from the active site. So you can say that the inhibition is actually a non-competitive inhibition um, type of uh, inhibition. Okay, so this is a two example. If you are interested, then of course you can always um, search for it and, and read through, or otherwise, you can just always read through um, from the sources here. Okay. And that's it for today. Um, for the remaining three minutes, I'm just gonna um, summarize a little bit what we're gonna do. Um, so next week we will have our quiz two. Okay, we will cover up until what um, inhibition. So inhibitor that we covered just now. Okay, on week eleven we will look at uh, enzyme activity in more detail, examples and whatnot. And in week twelve we will cover on the um, industrial application. So more on usage again. Um, it's related to week eleven. And then on week 13, we will do a catch-up session whereby it will be a live synchronous session. Um, you can discuss uh, about whatever you want. Um, but otherwise, um, the idea is for me to show you how do we actually use a protein data bank and how do you analyze um, some contents that is available um, on the website. Okay. Um, and, and on the same week, on week 13, if I'm not mistaken, you will have... Um, your alternative summative assessment so your final exam but not under my part it will be under prof Khalija's part on monday okay so you should have finished all profs um, section so on on wednesday uh, as per today you should be able to focus on my lecture and then on week 14 we will have our alternative sum summative assessment um, i will open um, for you guys to look at the questions um, on the same day at 12 o'clock um, and you need to submit within 12 hours okay so if you really focus um, you should be able to finish it between um, one one hour or so um, but if you actually do a lot of readings and not prepared then of course you will take longer um, and because I'm considering um, this is a, a final exam a substitution for your final exam uh, and because you need to do it at home, uh, you might have some internet problems and whatnot. So um, I'm opening the submission uh, for 12 hours. And also this test is an open book test. Okay, so you should expect uh, some level of difficulty. Okay, because uh, it's, again, it's open book. So you can Google and do whatever you want. Um, but, um, you know, um, what resources that you use, you will need to put it in um, the answer script. Okay, so whatever you have, say for example, you Google, uh, you found a website um, mentioning about the information that I'm asking in the question um, um, paper, 
then you need to write down what is the address okay so again that's why i'm giving you 12 hours um, to actually submit so um, i will open at exactly 12 um, pm so it will close at 12 am and submission will be under uh, in spectrum using turn it in so as you know you simply cannot copy and paste um, so you need to have a certain degree of um, uniqueness in in your um, answer all right uh, it's already 15 minutes and these are some of the references that you can use um, throughout this lecture um, thank you and i bid you a good day see you guys